Motion to approve our portion of the agenda. Mr. Chairman. And a second. Second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. No opposed. I'll turn it over to Dr. Ayers. Sir, good evening. I want to take a chance, uh, an opportunity first to just introduce um, all of our associates who are here today. Um, I have um, Mr. Stribling online, I believe, but uh, Mr. Smith, Mr. Jones, Mr. Bryson, Darling Fox, our interim county manager. John Cubis is, is running a little behind. He's our interim attorney. And then Ms. Winchester, our, our clerk. Thank you. So we are going to start with a presentation and, and for those of us who um, recall this meeting a little over a year ago last year. Um, we talked about the prior priorities that this board um, created this list of revised rules. So we'll start with the presentation. And Greg, whenever you're ready, we'll pop that right up. refresh your memory we talked last year about our operations budget so our total operations budget for this entire district is nearly nine and a half million dollars you see that that is updated from last year and it's slightly higher who provides our funding it is the commissioners that are sitting right here and we're very grateful for them and then what is the most costly item we talked about this last year and we'll continue to talk about it it will always be our salaries our people are our great What's the capital budget for Jackson County Public Schools? About $1.5 million. And I won't read those all to you, but you will see that that is um, delineated out in each of our areas. Um, who provides the funding? Again, our county commissioners. And then the most expensive item that we spend on capital is our one to one devices. And considering, as we talked about last year, the fact that we moved um, into pandemic mode and now moving out we have learned that we are very successful um, at using technology for instruction but nothing will ever replace the people's resources that we have so 
So this is our priority list, and I'll spend a minute revisiting that. And this board made a decision in the winter of um, really 22, in September of 22, that we took this priority list that the Board of Education had had for many years, and they um, did a nice analysis on it and a conversation, and they kept some things but moved some things to the top. So obviously our cafeteria and classroom space at Fairview is our number one priority. Um, those of you that were here earlier, I appreciate you being here and getting to see and experience the entire pod school and then the cafeteria and the um, lack of access to the cafeteria. And so with that, um, with that being our priority, knowing that the cafeteria space will be hopefully approved at some point and let's get moving on that. We also need classroom space and we're going to talk a little more how these two items go together. Um, even though our second priority is to build a traditional middle school, we still do need classroom space here. And anybody sitting in this room um, has experienced the pod. And so I say that with such um, chagrin, the pod is not the most ideal setup for educating students. Our next priorities are, and I often couple these together, number three and number four are ADA upgrades to Smoky Mountain High School athletic stadium and then the track on Jones Street. We do not have a track here in um, Jackson County Public Schools at all. So we go visit and do not ever get to really host a match or a track meet unless we are fortunate enough to go to Western and say a lot of things that. Our fifth priority is a bus garage on the current site that we already are. Uh, I highly encourage you to visit the bus garage. It's from about the 1950s, I was going to say 40s. <laughs> um, we've just got a new bus in, and it was approved by this board um, two weeks ago, and so it is the largest activity bus that we have, seeing 72 passengers, and it will not fit in the bus garage. So our repairs are going to have to be made outside. Next is Blue Ridge Gym with performance space, and then finally the softball field upgrades at Webster. And you see the caveat that two of those projects, if, when we get a traditional middle school, that those will not be as much of a priority anymore because we will resolve some of that with the traditional middle school on the new site. After we met in January last year, um, I met with John Adams a couple times, and this board of commissioners has some very specific things that they wanted us to look into. So that's our purpose for meeting here today, is to give them the information they requested and talk through any additional questions that they might have before we move forward. So one of the things was a comprehensive student count, and you'll see that in the coming slide. The next was a, an overall picture of our athletic fields, and Chad will do a great job of presenting that. Um, also, a comprehensive justification for the Fairview project. Again, as I said, even though we are moving toward a traditional middle school and a different site, we still need the cafeteria and classroom space here. And then finally, uh, a comprehensive look about that middle school project. What will that look like? once we vacate some spaces in our elementary schools right now. So here's a quick glance of our numbers. I know it's hard for some of you to see if you're sitting out in the audience, but everybody has a copy of the presentation. These are the prior five years, including the current year, of our enrollment in Jackson County Public Schools. So you might just want to look across the bottom um, and see those numbers. We've had a slight dip in enrollment over the last five years. I would attribute a lot of that to the pandemic. If you look at those pandemic years where there was an even greater dip, and then we seem to be rebounding from there. Does that Any thoughts or questions down. about the prior five years? High school. Mm -hmm. Please interrupt me if you have a question. The next slide is a projection, and this projection is what our enrollment will look like over the next five years. This projection comes from us removing the senior class and then matriculating each grade level up and then estimating what our enrollment will be for our kindergarten class. So I tapped into Adam Holt, our testing accountability person, to do these projections for us. So you will see 
that the projections for the upcoming year show that we will continue to rebound and be at about 3,658 students in the year 2018. So again, summarizing our first priority is the Fairview Cafeteria and Classroom. We talked a lot about mobility issues. <coughs> Uh, we talked a lot about the access, even for a parent, if you're a parent coming to eat with your child and you have a stroller or you, you yourself are in a locker or something, your only opportunity to go to that cafeteria is to go outside in the elements, down the pathway, and then you've got to get yourself back up. And so that is definitely a concern that we have. We have a student currently that... Um, we would like to have over here at Fairview, he's in one of our special needs classes, but he is a wheelchair bound, and so we certainly can't allow that student to be here with no access. And it, is the, it will be the best thing for that student to have some access here and be with their like, like age peers. A couple glances of the cafeteria. The cafeteria serves our whole population, the number. The latest and greatest population of Fairview is 795. Just for your reference, the high school is about <coughs> the same. So they're just about a little hundred shy of having the same population as Central Mountain High School on this campus that we're at now. The cafeteria can only seat about 300 students at a time. With a population of 795 students, they start lunch at 10.20 a.m and they run all the way through one o'clock. So almost a three hour window of serving lunches in the cafeteria. Two groups of students do not eat in the cafeteria. That is our preschool classes and our kindergarten classes. We just don't have the space in which we start serving them lunch at 9.30 a.m. That would be lunch to me. You'll see also that that serving line, and you can't see from this photo, but there's a lot of storage that was typically in a kitchen be behind the serving line, we have in the Fairview cafeteria downstairs a refrigerator in the actual seating area, um, a couple closets and other storage areas that should not be in the actual cafeteria portion where students are eating. Okay. Our second priority is a traditional middle school. I will remind you that we talked a lot about converting a middle school last year from one of our elementaries to become a middle school. Looking now at the data that we have and the facility study that, that Chad has put together for us, it's certainly not feasible. We also have to think about when we're looking at a middle school, we are already having the hurdle of juggling district sports and elementary well, the school site sports as well as sharing our facilities with Little League and the rec department and such. So a gym is like a prime commodity around here. So we are looking at our numbers and we think it's the best to build a traditional middle school site away from any of our elementary schools. But that middle school would be all inclusive. We want a football field, a soccer field, a softball field a baseball field so that our students who are in middle school will be competitive with their other uh, peers across other districts and across the state of North Carolina. Us being a K-8 or pre-K-8 model is unique. There are 11 in the state of North Carolina, 11 districts that have pre-K or K-8 schools. There are five of those that have only pre-K-8 those other six have a mixed model, Wake County, Charlotte, Mill. They have some elementary and middle and then some K-8 school. But we're one of five in the state of North Carolina that is exclusively a pre-K or a K-8 model. We are behind the times. Um, of those five, one other is in the Mountain Watauga area and the other three are on the coast of North Carolina where geographically they are very, very spread out. So without that traditional middle school, there are a lot of opportunities that we are lacking. Those who've been attending the tours have seen um, a lot of the programs that we are desperately trying to make and increase so that our students will be more prepared for going out into the, either the workforce or going to university. So some of the things that we're looking at are expanding our career and technical education opportunities, um, looking at 
science labs, all of those things are things that a pre-K-8 school cannot offer. A pre-K-8 school, none of those in Jackson County can offer a vast variety of those at each school the way we are structured now. There are a lot of words on the next few pages, so I'm not going to read you all of those. You have a copy, this is nothing different than um, we had last year. I just want to point out a couple of highlights. So advanced coursework, if we had a traditional middle school setting, then we could offer students who are advanced and ready to move on to more rigorous and advanced curriculum, we could do that. Right now, we can't offer a full class of math one students at all of our elementary schools because we may only have six at one school while we have 27 at another school. And so some of our schools currently are serving math one students who need that advancement in another eighth grade class while they're teaching eighth grade students and having five or six work on advanced coursework which is online. Our students with disabilities and at-risk students would have more opportunity in a traditional middle school setting because there would be more opportunity for CTE classes, more opportunity for teachers to collaborate, um, and more opportunity to serve some of our most needy students that might not be a special needs student, but it's all of those educators coming together and being able to serve a population where they have that opportunity to give something different than what just a singleton teacher school does. The next, again, is that access to CTE opportunities. We have STEM programs at three of our schools. We had an ag class at Foley Valley School until December, and unfortunately, we lost that teacher. So now that ag class is not offered, but if you were a student at Scotts Creek and you were interested in agriculture, you wouldn't have an opportunity to, because they have a STEM class there. So bringing together all of those CTE teachers in a one traditional middle school setting would mean our students had the opportunity to dabble in lots of CTE classes. Next is access to arts and visual and performing arts, band, music, theater. We do not have a theater program, a, a performance theater program in any of our elementary schools at this moment. We do have band, thankfully, the last two years we've been working hard on expanding band opportunities. So we have a band, op, a, band a small band, at Smoky Mountain Elementary, but that is growing. And then we have band available at Scotts Creek, which is also fairly new in the last uh, year and a half, two years. And then we have very robust and full band programs for our middle grades at both Fairview and Foley Valley. So again, an opportunity for all of those band students to come together. And I'm sure you could have a conversation with a high school band teacher who would love to see a tremendous number of students coming interested in the band program that had the same opportunity before they get to the ninth grade. And then finally, the teacher collaboration piece. And I, I don't end that on a light note because that is so critical to the success of our students. In each of our um, elementary schools, we have one math teacher for middle school, for seventh and eighth, and one sixth grade teacher, or sometimes one math teacher that teaches all three of those grade levels. So when there uh, is a need for professional collaboration, there's a singleton at each of those schools. And the only opportunity they have for professional collaboration is our quarterly, we call them PLCs, professional learning communities, quarterly meetings where they come together across the district. And we have reinstated those over the last couple of years. It wasn't happening, um, partly because of COVID, but partly because we had not adopted common curriculum materials, but we have that now for both, both math and reading, and we're working toward other areas. So that teacher collaboration piece is absolutely critical. Um, on a tour yesterday, when we walked in Smoky High, they were having a math PLC, and they were having good conversation for, about freshman classes and how different kids coming from the various elementary schools were either struggling or scoring. And so they were adapting their thinking, because we have a um, curriculum map, they were adapting that to meet the needs of students. And without something, they started talking about, well, you know, this kid got a lot more in um, <coughs> standards, while these students got more in these standards. And I think 
that comes back to the singleton teacher at our elementary school. So it was a, a really organic conversation that came along while we just walked in and just happened to find it. And so you will see and you will hear this from a lot of educators in this room that over time, as students matriculate from a high school, from a middle school to a high school, you see more of that common opportunity um, to collaborate with teachers with a more succinct understanding of uh, the academics that they're working on. Student transitions, our students only transition really one other time in their entire career, and that is between eighth grade and ninth grade, unless they move from one elementary school to another over time. And so transitions are hard. If you think about being that 14-year-old adolescent who has been with his or her same cohort of students all of their career, and then moving into a middle school and into a high school where four different schools feed in there, you can imagine personalities and how that might go with them. And so when they don't have another opportunity to transition and melt together, I think that they're missing out on an important piece. And those adolescent years are so key to being successful beyond um, a public school setting and after they graduate. And then the next part is about staff training and ex expertise. I've touched a little bit on that with having those singletons and the barriers and struggles that we have to get those folks together. Um, I've been working with Angie Beals and she is working for the first time on a collective group of our band teachers, our middle grades band teachers, and they are coming together once a quarter and that had not happened before. A, because we didn't have a band program at Smith Mountain Elementary or a very small band program at Scott Street. So we now currently have band at all of our, in all of our middle grades and this is an opportunity for the first time this year for them to come together and collaborate and they're working on district concerts and collecting music together so that they can share with the community and be prepared for high school. Um, lastly, I, I have to point this out without reading all of that. In this room, you have every principal in this district. In this room, you have every principal at an elementary school and they are responsible for uh, observing, evaluating, leading instructional meetings with teachers from pre-K all the way to grade eight. I've been a principal. I could not tell you all the things in the middle school curriculum that I was principal of in sixth grade, so I can't even fathom the idea of having to be able to understand how to work with and guide and be the instructional leader for a curriculum that starts at three-year-old curriculum all the way through eighth grade. In addition to those principals and assistant principals, counselors, all of our elective teachers are serving those kids from age three to age 14. And that, there's some counselors sitting in this room, that is difficult. That's the simplest way I can say that. I see some head shaking in here. So again, when you're looking at going to the traditional middle school, that means you're taking out three three levels out of our elementary schools and those folks can really become experts and work more closely with their staff. Also, with the traditional middle school setting, you will see that we would have the opportunity to have uh, district teams and it wouldn't just be called a district team, it would be called the middle school team and there would be one middle school team. I've shown some pictures up here of some of our district athletes, our boys. A uh, basketball team won the championship two weeks ago, I believe, was the, was the big game. I've never seen the gym in Smoky Mountain High School so full since I've been here. It was a packed house. But those boys are representative in that the top picture with the plaque in the middle. They represent three of our elementary schools. So we had a student from Smoky E. We did not have a Scott Street student that tried out, and the rest are from Big Man Crowley Valley. So knowing that, thinking back to that opportunity that our middle grade students have, and feeding into a high school program, I'm sure our high school coaches would love to see kids who have been playing together for three consecutive years before they get to high school. You will see volleyball, um, our cross country and track, football, wrestling, and then our girls um, who are cheerleading. 
right now our, our middle school dog cheerleaders are loud and proud and so so excited of what the work they're doing and they're looking forward to going into high school but imagine what all of these things might look like if they had been together for three consecutive years other extracurricular activities also could happen in some schools we have robotics in some schools we have chess clubs it just depends on what the school can a um, staff and b have the time to fit in so here's the big question that you all as board of commissioners asked last time if we were to get this in a timely man manner that means that there are building spaces that would be vacated what would we do with those and so you'll see in a few minutes when chad presents that we are over utilizing every bit of every inch of space that we have in every building but these are the things that we're looking at doing with the vacated spaces at fairview particularly here the kindergarten building which houses uh, four kindergarten classrooms and two preschools we would like to make that completely preschool and that could be our, our centralized location knowing that southwestern child development center closed four months ago now we think we could fill up every one of those classrooms and serve our students we already have a really good partnership with head start so we even could possibly consider partnering with them and serving students under age three with some child care because jackson county desperately needs child care and we hear that as a community and you hear that as a school community at fairview we would want to remodel the pods repurpose the pods i don't know what what exact word you want to use but this space is not conducive to a, an appropriately sized classroom c pod that we were in earlier on our tour has eight pieces of the pie for classrooms and you'll hear from chad in just a little while ago that would probably turn into four classroom spaces so you will hear how compacted our students are and what educational opportunities they're missing by being so compacted in there. Our empty middle grade spaces, so when I look at Smoky Mountain Elementary School and even here um, at Fairview, the seventh and eighth grade wing um, here and the Smoky E holds our six, eight students, all those spaces can be converted to either additional CTE classes because we are wanting to look and start exposing students to workforce opportunities as early as grade four and five and that follows along with our state superintendent's um, desire and goal because she has labeled this the year of the workforce um, we would also want to add some science labs none of our uh, elementary school well scotts creek might have some more appropriate space but none of them have a true science lab our fifth grade students are tested on the EOG for a fifth grade science test. So those are other other opportunities that we could use the space for. Um, and you'll see we have a we have a plan. We have a plan for these vacated spaces, but more than anything, it is to allow for adequate space in a classroom for learning opportunities. Does anyone have a thought or a question about that before we move on? I would like to add one thing. Absolutely. I think it's a great presentation. Um, it covers most of what we've been concerned about. There's just one thing that I'm thinking of, and that is the emotional um, learning of students that are in middle school. It's the it's the time of a child's life when they start really making decisions about their identity, where they fit, and if, and if you have a middle schooler, you understand they're very vulnerable and confused around that time and i think that as a school district and as a parent especially but as a school district if we put some like evidence of our care in building this middle school for them and saying we see you we want to be there for you and we want to do something special for you so that when the kids do reach that age they feel like they're targeted with care not just you know into another grade drawn into another classroom so i think they're real vulnerable during that time and i think that needs to be taken into consideration when we think about going forward and, and your comment about you know finding your identity that means what do i want to do with my life i mean those of us yeah. who have been middle school teachers or work in the middle grades we know that it is a vulnerable time and they're they're trying to figure out where they fit 
And I think that's the best way to say that because you don't know if you're going to be the athlete or maybe you're going to be the bean girl. I was a bean girl. Or maybe you're going to be um, very engaged and involved in robotics and some sort of engineering. And I think that middle school is a more appropriate place to give them that first opportunity to dabble. Thank you for making that point. Other questions or comments from either board? Is there any data done uh, for the number of students that might be homeschooled that could come into a middle school environment? Is there any numbers in Jackson County for that? I, I do not have that number, but I can certainly get that number. We do have a uh, homeschool group here in Jackson County. Um, often we get inquiries about whether they can play athletics or not. Our rule uh, policy in Jackson County is that they can play if they're enrolled half time, two courses a day. So we do have a population of homeschool students that at the time are, I don't know the exact number, but I can get that. I recall in our last meeting that that might affect numbers in a, in a palatable way to to spend taxpayers' dollars on, on whatever we, decisions make. That's a good point. Thank you. I will get that number and I can send that out in an email. <coughs> Other thoughts, questions, comments? Dr. Aaron, what location? So, I, I have been looking, we've been talking, our whole leadership team has been talking about this for an entire year. So, I don't have an exact location, but I can give you an estimate of where I think and our team it thinks it might be most appropriate. But that all depends on availability of land, um, the feasibility of building on that land. Um, so, thinking about taking students from Coley Valley, Fairview, Scotts Creek and then Smoky Mountain Elementary, I would really am looking between Silva and say Dillsboro area. There is land available on 107, just up the road. I think it would be a nightmare to put another school on 107 because if you haven't driven through the dismissal time between Smoky High and Fairview, it would just not be wise of us to do that. So I don't think that that's the target. This right here is the target area. Um, there, there is some land available in some other locations, and I've just on the backside been inquiring. Um, but it will all come down to obviously price, funding, and then if it really is feasible to build a middle school. We've talked a little bit about uh, the estimated number of acres, 25 to 30 will give us the appropriate number of acres to have a football field and a soccer field and those additional things that we want. My concern is <coughs> students having to drive and their parents having to drive all the way from Quala District 1, that's just too far away now, but um, all the way, driving all the way over to say Thunderwick. Right. <coughs> seems out of the way to me. And then also, you didn't mention Blue Ridge School in there. Is that going to remain as a, is the plan to that as a K-12? Blue Ridge will remain as is as a K-12, okay. yes sir. And then also, uh, just talking about sports, uh, I'd imagine there's one boys basketball team, one girls basketball team. Yes, <coughs> and that's another concern that I have. Uh, each school right now has a basketball team, softball team, baseball team. Uh, and Mr. Colley, the basketball coach at one time was, he made, I think there's 10 or 11 uh, people on the basketball team, does that sound right? Maybe more. So, what do you, so five schools, that's 55 athletes per team. So that's, that's taken away some opportunities there. So we've got to remember that. Uh, I think that's a good point that you make. Having been a middle school principal before, our Tudor Elementary Schools would offer intramural type teams. So this school would be pre-K-5 and there might be some fourth and fifth grade opportunities for teams. Um, okay. And then currently, all of our schools can't afford a team. Right. Um, for example, um, Smoky Mountain Elementary, if we'd be successful at building a softball team, other schools last year were not able to do that because some of those, most of those kids who were interested 
we talk about the district and the district and you either made it or did not. So we do, I do see the point in that we would not have as many new students who are participating in athletics, um, but we're always not filling a team at every school. So it wouldn't cut as many as you think, um, but it's, it's a really good point to consider. And I think it would be important for us to have those opportunities intramural um, and such. But we also still do have rec and the youth little league teams that are available to us. But there's other opportunities you're providing them with too that aren't aren't as athletic. You know, you gotta have some of the extracurricular activities. A middle school can offer that each individual school can't offer that, that might be more tailored to what a kid really wants to do. So. And right now we're giving out more than 55 students by not being able to offer the extracurricular activities that we have available. Yes. I mean, my child's not into sports anymore in sixth grade here at Fairview, and so outside of that, there are a few opportunities, but there could be a lot more um, if we had a middle school um, and a kid or Like speaking to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, there's all kinds of benefits. I agree. Those are concerns that I've heard from from the public, it's called me, voice the concerns uh, about their child not being able to uh, play sports and being cut. I'll tell you what, it's being cut from a team or from a tryout is very disheartening. But uh, I know there's, Mr. Jameson, there's, there's more uh, benefits out there, but sometimes students, they they live on sports and they love sports. So. Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Uh, again, I'm Chad Robertson with Park Nexon. Uh, we're also the architects on your uh, uh, aquatic center out there as well. So we're happy to get the moving along for you guys. So we did uh, go to all the different facilities and I'll walk you through the process that we went through uh, as we were going through that. So um, obviously all of these are the different schools that we visited throughout the county. And the tools that we used, we evaluated them using uh, the the Department of Public Instruction's site and building analysis tool. And they, they generally use this when you're deciding to tear a building down or to build a new facility. So it's a good tool. It gives you a scoring method. Uh, so it gives you some good data to use to judge uh, the quality of the spaces. The next thing that we did was a, a utilization study where it was possible. Um, and I'll go through that with each one of the different uh, schools and, and talk about that. DPI publishes a space profile for K through eight schools based on the number of students that each one of those uh, buildings has. And it gives you a recommendation of the square footage associated with that. We have to make some adjustments uh, because of some of the amenities that some of the schools have in order so that we're comparing apples to apples. And so we did that and it shows the number of students that that building should then occupy or should be able to house. Um, two of them in particular are the uh, Jackson Community School and the Blue Ridge because they're so unique, they don't have a model that DPI uh, provides for a comparison. So we did look at those just from an evaluation standpoint of uh, the quality of the space we have. Um, and then the last thing we'll do is we'll make re uh, some recommendations uh, for the schools and then also for the Smoky Mountain Athletics. So the first school is uh, Cullowee Valley School. Um, and this is one of the better schools that you have. Uh, these diagrams here are graphs associated with uh, the different components that are used to measure the success of the school. And I won't go through this in detail for each one of those, but happy to answer uh, any question. But basically there's a score associated with site ad adequacy, uh, the location of the facility, uh, whether sewer and water are available on the site, uh, what's the quality of parking and traffic control, uh, playground space and uh, play field, 
are there any drainage issues? Are there any environmental issues? And so there's a score associated with each one of those. It's from zero uh, to, to twos, and in some instances, uh, two and a half. But generally, a brand new building are the ones that are going to give you in that two range right there. So, uh, for example, in Chloe right now, the, the school score is very high uh, in most of those areas. So uh, we're looking at the red line right there. So with the exception of play fields, and the drainage areas, the school scoring as if it were a brand new school. So very positive condition uh, as to that. The second step in this is look at the, the building and judge uh, whether or not it has educational program adequacy, whether it has any historical architectural significance, um, whether it's code compliant, uh, whether it's safe for students to occupy that space. Uh, relationships to other buildings that are on the site, um, and that could be any addition that you might have uh, as well, uh, whether it's handicap accessible and uh, the physical conditions of the building. And we're looking at mechanical, electrical, plumbing, all those different uh, infrastructural components that we have, uh, as well as the, if, is there, are there any hazardous materials that are existing in the building? Uh, so with this on color, we, you can see that it scored very high. Uh, the, the dotted orange line is what an average school would score. And so with Pelley scoring above average in, in most instances, you generally don't want the building to have historical significance, especially if it's, uh, if it's something you're trying to add on to. So in this case, it's, it's better to be zero in that instance. Um, one of the things I'll pause just a second and talk about is the utilization. And this is where we look to see how many square feet uh, you have within that building and how many students it should occupy. So. Um, in this example, the current student population uh, is, for, for the student population that we have uh, would be 604, and the DPI model would be 620. Uh, so there's a, a very close utilization, so it's, it's nearly 100% utilized uh, in most instances right there. So the available capacity that you have there uh, is only 529. So you take, it's actually above the average utilization for the number of square foot that Square feet that you have. So, if you had the optimal model, then in Cullowee, the building would actually be 116,000 square feet, but it's actually slightly smaller than that. So, the utilization is above average uh, in that instance. And you'll find that consistent throughout uh, each one of the different buildings uh, with some minor exceptions. So, we went and visited Scott's Creek and looked at that facility. Um, there are some drainage issues that are being addressed on that campus. And so it did score a little lower uh, in that area. Uh, parking and traffic control, again, is something else that's a little bit of a challenge on that site, uh, but that's being addressed as well. And then the facility itself uh, scored very high. There was some minor handicap accessibility issues that needed to be addressed, but in general, that's a very uh, good school and, and good stop. Um, again, Scott's Creek is the, the utilization of this. Uh, the square footage that is available from a, a DPI comparison would be about 102,000 102, square feet compared to 97,000 square feet. So that one's slightly underutilized. However, uh, and this is something that Dr. Ayers was pointing out, when we start to look at the actual program components that are in there, in particular, it's missing science classrooms. Uh, so it may score equal, we're almost equal, uh, to what the DPI, DPI model has, but it's it's missing some of those critical components uh, from a science cl classroom perspective. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that we talked about square footage is simply not necessarily the challenge. Okay. Yeah. At Scott's Creek, when he is looking at the square footage, he has to also consider the auditorium. They're lucky to have an auditorium. Can we stick around? Oh, sure. So when we, if you look at the DPI model. Uh, it doesn't show that you would have an auditorium in that in that school, but that's an amenity that the school has. So you have to add that to the DPI model so that you're comparing apples to apples uh, with the comparison. If you didn't and you divided the number of students into that model, you would it would show that it's way underutilized, and that that is absolutely not the case out there. So we have to do a little bit of math to get everything on the same the same playing field. There, so right. the other thing about Scotts Creek is every space is utilized. I mean, what was uh, uh, closets are now offices. I mean, it's it's amazing how those spaces have been utilized out there. So, um, and then we visited Smoky Mountain Elementary. Um, 
This one had some challenges as far as location as being a little bit more remote, uh, access to playing fields, but in general, it scores, it scores pretty high. Uh, same thing for the building itself, it's scoring relatively high. All of this means that the, that their infrastructure and the stock of the building is being taken care of. Uh, so they're using your tax dollars appropriately. Um, that's why we start to look at the, the building utilization and see if, see if it makes sense that there needs to be an addition or, or a different uh, solution for that. So this building um, should be 77,000 square feet. It's actually 69,000, so it's about 11% overutilized in there. Again, this is another one that's got classrooms being uh, utilized in a bunch of different ways and places that weren't really originally designed to do that. Um, Fairview, obviously we're in this uh, facility tonight. This one is the, the most challenged of all of the schools that we investigated. Um, and when we started looking at this, um, you know, we, we had some real questions because there were conversations like, oh, we need more classrooms, we need more classrooms. And I'm like, oh, do we really need more classrooms? You absolutely need more classrooms uh, in this facility. Um, so some of the challenges that we have, is the site adequate? Um, it's very tight. And on the where we are right now and where you guys were earlier, as far as the location of the cafeteria, which is over to the, the far right here, there are a number of utilities in that location, so it makes it very difficult uh, to add on to the facility in, in that area. There's also a high uh, electrical line, high energy electrical line that runs over to the plan west right here. So it's it's very tight uh, on this site. Uh, there's uh, parking and traffic control or something else that are, are challenging where they're operating on an average level. Uh, green space and outdoor space is something else that's a premium uh, on this site. There are a few drainage issues over near the uh, cafeteria space. And then when we start to look at the, the facility itself, um, it does score slightly below average in a number of locations, in particular in handicap accessibility. And you, you guys um, saw that tonight when you were going down to the uh, cafeteria space. Same for mechanical, electrical, it's scoring average. So that means that the, the lifespan of the, that equipment is starting to get to the near, uh, near term end of its life. Um, this one is the most interesting from a utilization standpoint uh, because right now there's 795 students in here. The model that we ran was 770 students. Um, so it's over 112% uh, utilized on this campus. A couple of other things in this, the way that we do this calculation is it's a, it's a straight calculation, but when you add the pods in here, uh, so the square footage of a circle may be the same as that square footage of a square, but they, the way that it is, uh, the efficiency of that space is tremendously lower. Uh, so you go down into the cafeteria space and with that circular space in there, you may be able to fit 250 people in there, but it's, it's way smaller uh, than it should be in that area. So the, the kitchen itself is um, over half of the size it should be in that location. Uh, the cafeteria by math says it should be a thousand square feet left more bigger, but it's actually, it should be much bigger than that just because of the shape of it in that location. So definitely some deficiencies in that location. And we would not recommend trying to add cafeteria space in that location because of the freezer areas and all the utilities that were located in that, that area. Yes? just the layout of like the pre-k kindergarten I mean Eleanor has worked with us tremendously to have her teachers even come down to pick up food um, you can't get accessible for just all the things that we would like to do here and we can't do because of the layout set up in space thank you to the staff Okay. Uh, we also visit the Jackson Community School uh, this is one that there's not space profile associated with it just to the, the way that it's used. 
Um, with the bus garage, uh, Dr. Rick pointed out, it's it's definitely seen better days. Um, and you can see that the bus uh, can't actually be lifted uh, into that area. And so it's, it's in need of repair, significant repair or replacement, and that could happen on the, the existing site. Um, we looked at Blue Ridge School and the early college, um, and then you know, there, there are a number of different challenges on that just because it's so close to the floodplain in that area and their drainage issues. The building itself is, is operating at, at a fairly good level. There is some issues with the relationship to other buildings on the site. It's just because it's stretched out uh, so far in that area. And then uh, the physical condition of this building is a little bit less than some of the other areas that we we looked at uh, mechanical and hazardous materials were running average uh, in those areas as well. Um, so the summary of all of these, these investigations that we did, on average, uh, the schools are running about 110% above their utilization. Uh, the highest utilization in growth areas that we saw were in the pre-K through the K, uh, fifth grade. Um, and that's a little bit of an anomaly when you start to look at the space profiles for uh, DPI. You know, all of the sites and the structures are at average or above average in general, which I think is very positive. Um, Fairview is obviously the one that's most challenged with site constraints, uh, ADA issues, the cafeteria, uh, the classroom configuration. And there's an immediate need for a new cafeteria, a kitchen, and then a minimum of six classrooms. And I say a minimum because there would need to be an evaluation done of the pods just to see how you could optimize that pod to get an appropriate classroom uh, in those, those different settings. So that's at least six classrooms. Um, bus garage should be replaced on the site uh, and that should, could be a long-term item. Uh, one of the items at Blue Ridge is the kitchen and the service line uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, right now students are getting served in the, ca in the actual corridor of the area and that's, that's not appropriate from an egress standpoint. I'll pause right here and see if there's any questions you know, on uh, the schools in particular, and we can jump over to the, to the and, high school. Uh, did you do an evaluation on, um, I know it's priority thin, but uh, Blue Ridge's performing arts and gym, we was did. that part of the, the analysis, and how did that score in terms of? We did look at that previously, not with this study, but we had done an investigation of whether or not that would actually fit on the site, and it, and it will. We would be able to add uh, an appropriate size gymnasium and some additional classrooms uh, in that area. And it could be that it would be uh, you know, six through eight is what we were planning to put in, in those configurations so we could get some of that CT and the science classrooms in that area. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Agent structure. I mean, if in some instances, if there is any hazardous material, then it, it would be just because of agent structure. If it would be less, we didn't do any testing. That's just generally based on age of the facility. Yeah. Now, if you demolish something, you have to get it as fast as possible. That's right. Done. Yeah. 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 It's required by state law. That's right. Any questions on the schools specifically? Jump over talking about. Uh, so we did an assessment of the athletic facility at Smoky Mountain uh, High School. Um, this is the site. We looked at three different uh, locations. A is uh, up on the northern portion of the site. Uh, B is where the existing baseball field is located, located and then C is where the existing uh, football field is located. So um, at site A, it previously been graded at some point uh, over time for a future baseball field. Uh, and a softball field in that area. Um, we look to see whether there's a viable option to put an eight-lane tra track in that, that space based on the existing configuration that we have. Uh, we also looked at the B site to see if it made sense to leave the, the baseball field in that configuration uh, or to add any additional amenities there. There's a significant amount of grade change between the baseball field and the existing uh, football field. So, uh, handicap accessibility, and that's been addressed uh, recently by giving access to the to the baseball field in that location. And then we also looked at the C site to see uh, what opportunities there were with the existing field, whether a track could actually fit on the existing field, um, and then if there were any other amenities such as 
uh, new concession stands, toilets that could be added to that. So I'll walk you guys through each one of those. Um, when we start doing the evaluation, uh, we're looking at all the different uh, constraints that we have on the site. One of them in particular is the floodplain that exists uh, where the baseball field currently is right now, actually extends down just below where we are right now. So there's a fair amount of floodplain. There's a significant grade change uh, from the existing uh, football field down to the baseball field. So that presents challenges in itself as far as trying to make something uh, homogenous in that location. So the first option we looked at was whether the track would fit on uh, the, the site on, is it Jones Street, right? Jones Street, okay. Um, so it is actually able to fit on that site. Um, and so we do have to uh, tilt it slightly, but it will fit on that area and we provide an eight lane regulation size track. It would also provide a regulation size soccer field on that location as well. Um, it's accessible to the building so that you could have uh, toilets that wouldn't have to create another toilet uh, facility out there. So that's a positive. Uh, it would also be a location for scoreboard, uh, perimeter fencing, spectator areas, uh, a scoring booth with power and data, and then also field lighting uh, in that location as well. So that's, that's the overall site that's the existing uh, blow up of that. So the next thing we did was we looked at the uh, baseball uh, field and see if there was an opportunity in that location simply by reorganizing the site. Um, it would require demolishing the existing baseball field and rotating the field around. Um, and so there are you know, obvious challenges associated with that and cost implications for that as well. But you are able to fit a regulation baseball and a regulation softball field uh, in that area. Um, the next one that we looked at was the site C, which is the existing football field. And you know, one of the things that is a challenge there is, is that there's not enough toilets uh, on the site. So increasing the number of toilets and providing handicap accessibility to the visitor side of the facility as well as uh, the existing uh, the existing home side as well. Part of our study looked at upgrading the concession, the press box, and then, as I mentioned, providing that accessible route to the uh, press box and to the visitor side as well. Uh, so this first option that we looked at basically would provide a ramp from the, the track area up along the side up to a new uh, concession uh, area that could be uh, on that upper portion right there, which is the other portion of that side. We also looked at an opportunity on the south, the plan south side here, uh, to renovate the field house that could include uh, concessions, uh, restrooms uh, for the visitor side seating, and that would be completely accessible from the, the visitor side. And there's a bunch of different options uh, that are associated with that. These are just the ones that we kind of consolidated uh, from doing the option here. Um, it's roughly at 22 feet of elevation from the field to the, to the press box area. So that, that becomes a very long ramp in that condition. Uh, it's about 264 feet of ramp, but you gotta have all these different landings in order to make that uh, accessible. Now the press box facility would have concessions, uh, men and women's toilets on both sides. Um, and then as you moved up uh, to the second level, there would be a green room. Uh, because of the size of this facility, it would require stairs and elevator uh, in order to, to access that. So it does uh, cause the, the cost of that facility to go up. At the highest level, there would be coaches box, toilets, and then elevator that I, that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the summary uh, of this is that the you know, the track and the field will fit up on that upper area. There is an opportunity to bring softball onto the site. We did go to the existing softball field uh, and it is a wonderful field. Uh, so moving the, the field uh, to this location and relocating that would be an expense that wouldn't necessarily be necessary unless you wanted to have this field uh, on this campus as well. So we looked a couple other options alternate locations, you know, would the track fit where the uh, baseball field is now and then move the baseball fields uh, into that upper area. It, it will fit there. Uh, however, you're building a very expensive uh, track in the floodplain. And uh, if some of our neighbors have seen how, how quickly with the floods that we get, they can get washed away, especially if you put turf on that field uh, as well. Um, the other option that we looked at is, is, is it possible to put a regulation size track 
all of the existing uh, around the existing football field. And it, it is possible, but it would require relocating the road uh, that we drove in as we were coming up here. So you can see over the, the large area, the center line of the road is that dark dashed line. The field itself would have, or the track would actually protrude out into the road, and so it would require uh, reconfiguration of that. Um, where the existing gym is, there's a tremendous slope right there, so there's a very limited amount of opportunity we have to cut back into that, that slope in that location right there. Um, again, there, there are opportunities for bringing handicap accessibility uh, down to this area. And one of the other challenges about putting the base of the football field uh, and track in this location is that grade change that I mentioned earlier. And with 20 feet of grade change, there would be a tremendous amount of fill, or the stands for the visitors would be up on a 20 foot, basically, plank uh, in that area. Uh, so these are the different configurations, uh, the alternates that we put together. The base layout, which would say, uh, by simply adding the track and the soccer field to that up the location, they have the option where you can put the track and field on the lower location with the baseball and softball in the upper location. Again, there's expense associated with that that may not be necessary uh, just because the condition of the baseball field is great uh, and the track will fill in that upper area as well. And then obviously we looked at that consolidated condition and it does cause relocation of the ferry road coming in to the, to the site. I think it's the orange way. I think our, our best option is the base layout with the softball field and turn in the baseball field. And it gets every, everything on site softball girls are not having to drive the webs down. So, so one of the downsides of uh, um, changing the configuration of the baseball field and softball as it did is that both the baseball program and softball program, um, parents, community went together to build indoor um, batting cages. If you alter these and you were to do that, then you would reduce the accessibility to that. So it, it, you know, if you move Jones Street property now, now baseball and softball don't have batting cages. Um, and so if you, we would have to, we would be taking facilities away if we did not incorporate indoor batting cages in the, in the baseball field. I'm talking about putting the softball field down where the baseball field is, turning the baseball field. Yep. And so, DOT is still going to have to make a determination whether they're going to be in there or not. So we may have to remove those anyway. That's been determined. We do not. We will not be losing the, the batting cages. Okay. Um, but if we were to move softball on, then now women's softball would not have batting cages, but baseball would. Oh. Uh, I see. So see baseball the, cages, the batting cages are at Webster. Correct. Not they both have equal facilities right now. Indoor um, batting cages for both programs at Webster and at, at Smoky Mountain Lawn Care. What? I, I guess my. Can they not share the facility? Well, so you could, but then we would be coming back to reducing the facilities that kids have uh, to be able to move it on campus. So the question comes, is it is it as important to have it on campus with lesser facilities, or is it important to keep them in their location with improved facilities? Could we not put a batting cage for both on that facility? On, on layout A, I mean, is that just not an option? No, there, there is. I mean, you, you just be building. That's right. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, so. I, I would think that that would be what we would want to do anyway. If we're going to move the whole field, then let's build a new facility. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're not trying to move equity. We're trying to right. bring it's it closer. Right. That's a great to point. Home. But with moving, reorienting the baseball and then adding the softball, are going to be tearing down the current um, uh, Lake Greenfield house right there and rebuilding that too. So that's another piece that we have to consider is if we're going to put them, and we would love to have everything on campus. Yeah, let's build one structure. There, we're we're just going to have house, to baseball. tear down currently usable facilities to do that. They have mobile. Right. It's, it's both, but they don't have a. If we build a new facility down there that can house the softball concessions, <coughs> restrooms, everything down there. Facilities all at one location. We're not, I mean, now we're manning four buildings where we could do one. And 
have it a little bit more. It just needs to be cheaper in the long run. The recommendations that are coming out of this is obviously that Fairview is the highest priority um, to add that new kitchen and the cafeteria space, the minimum of six classrooms. We would recommend studying the existing pod configuration to see how many classrooms we could get in. I, my instinct tells me that, that it's going to need at least two more classrooms once we go through that uh, exercise right there. So, um, The second piece is to study possible sites for a future middle school, uh, address the Smoky Mountain Athletics, and then develop a plan that Dr. Ayers has presented as far as uh, how to backfill some of these existing schools and then address the Blue Ridge kitchen and the survey line as, as kind of the highest priorities. Um, one of the things that we're doing, and this is at a very high level, uh, is looking at the budgets associated with these um, and what that looks like from a cost model standpoint per year uh, so that you guys could plan for what the uh, cost are going to be on, a, on an annual basis. So, Fairview Elementary School, um, the cost range is somewhere between 24 and $30 million, uh, depending on the extent of the existing uh, renovations that need to happen. Uh, the Blue Ridge School and the kitchen and serving area, somewhere between $6 million and $7.5 and million. Um, the middle school due diligence process, uh, between $200,000 and $250,000, depending on what site constraints that you have right there. Um, and then a new middle school uh, would be somewhere between 143 million and 157 uh, million. Uh, and then the bus garage, uh, I'm sorry, Smoky Mountain High School is somewhere between 18 million and 22 million. And then the bus garage is between seven and, and 7.7 .7 million and 9.7 million dollars. So, so one of the things that's critical as we start, I know those are big numbers, sorry. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you guys can take a breath now. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it's it's amazing what we have seen. Um, we did Asheville Middle School in 2012. It was $36 million. Um, and we're doing Ash County Middle School right now, and it's nearly 100. Uh, so it's that's what kind of uh, uh, increase that we've seen across the, the time that COVID What would be the, the estimated square footage for 700 middle school students? It, it's a, between 155 and 160,000 square feet uh, for that. But I would say we want to be forward thinking to not build a school for 800 kids, but right. build a school for 150,000 kids is a, a perfect place to assess. That's a big school. Yes, it is. Is it multi story? No. Because of the site constraints that we have in Western North Carolina, most of these are multi story. I mean, you just you can't get enough area uh, to build them all on one single floor. It is. Yeah. And that one was designed for 900 students there. So. Dr. Harrison, I'm going to ask this too. Is there any grants out there to help with some of the. So we have applied for the GPI needs based grants the last three cycles that we've had, but we've applied for current projects. We are learning that the Department of Public Instruction really likes to fund new projects. Um, if you haven't seen any recently, Franklin got awarded $62 million. So they have uh, leveled it out for an elementary project. They will only give this much in middle and high. So there is $52 million is the max that they will give, I think is the, the number for a middle school project, which will be about a third of what we're looking at. Um, we've been told that they will cycle those grants again. 
next on the agenda is July. So instead of writing our grant for what we've been asking for, uh, I would like to write one specifically for middle school, seeing their pattern of what they've been awarding over the last three cycles. So if they would award us a third of that, I think that, that would be green. You know, there's no guarantee. I will say that not many Western North Carolina school districts have been, been given awards. Seems like that's been going a few counties that still have KA to take a hard look. Yeah. Well, and we haven't traditional middle school right, year. Right, right. That is exactly my justification when we need to hear in the state. So there's a lot of students here that that's how I want to write that. Yeah. Good point. Um, we looked at the schedule on this and, and the numbers that we provided uh, for the, the budgets include escalation and their total project costs. So that's not just construction dollars there as well. So um, one of the critical things is uh, on Fairview, what we try to do is stagger these so that you can get them moving and, and not uh, tie yourself up with the escalation on the projects. And so the design efforts, uh, due diligence would happen concurrently so that uh, that, that can happen in a, in a more rapid manner. The due diligence, identifying the sites and actually doing the due diligence on the process, that can be very fast or it can take well over a year. It just depends on what you find, what uh, utilities that you have on the site, if there are any other uh, factors that, that may cause it to extend, uh, whether it's wetlands or streams, or any of those things can cause the, the due diligence process to extend. So we, we would recommend getting that moving as fast as you can, just because you don't know how long that's gonna take until you have identified the site. Um, so we also staggered uh, some of the ones that have uh, less priority as far as uh, the most immediate needs. Uh, we, if you look at Fairview, and then the due diligence process and then the design efforts for Smoky Mountain, those are really the ones that would, would be the highest priority. And so you try to overlap the design efforts and the construction efforts uh, simultaneously. Well, one of the things that um, we see often is these numbers start to get very big, especially on a full middle school. So the longer that that waits, you're basically, the cost of that construction is gonna double between every seven to 10 years. Uh, and that's and that's if we have a normal uh, economic situation. So I know that I know it makes it a, even more of a challenge, but it has very consistently followed that pattern uh, throughout the, the projects that we're working on. So. And then the timeline on the chat, yes. the council yes. um, to approve from DPI. Yes. Yeah. I thought so. I just wanted yeah. to. Yeah. All of those. Uh, at each one of the phases, you submit the DPI, they're reviewing the documentation and uh, making comments, and we address those. So it is feasible if we were going to go for a Fairview cafeteria and classroom, you've got a suggested date here, I love it, it's 2-16-24 as a start, which is next week, I don't know. That cafeteria would be open for use on August the 23rd. August the 23rd. Yeah. Yeah. So about three years away. Yeah. And when we get to the middle school project, because we started next week having that conversation about yeah. funding the wonderful board of commissioners, it would open its doors on in the 28th, the year, just the year following the Fairview Cafeteria, if these projects were approved and funded by our county commission. So you're, you're running those um, parallel to each other at the same time. And one is massively larger than the other, but considering all things, they could open up in any of each other. What's the projected cost of the Fairview project? Can we get a copy of that before we leave? So Fairview, the range, I mean, again, these are total project costs. So uh, 24. 24 to 30 million. Uh, it, it really depends on what you have to do to the existing facility um, from, a, from a, the pod standpoint. What's the projected cost of uh, bus garage? At, at, I'm looking at seven million. Yes, so it's seven, seven point nine point seven, nine point seven, and that's escalated out uh, right. based on that, um, you know, based on the, the year that that would start to be.
That bus garage is that at the same location? Is that just upgrades to the same location? That would be on the same, you keep the existing bus garage right. operational, come to the side of it and build it up. Or slightly bigger. So. Yes. That can be done while the old one is in That's correct. Yeah, yeah. We just have to, it will be tight. Yes, sir. <laughs> Very tight. The record to be shown that uh, mine came with lipstick. Whose it is, but not mine. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure, but that's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that was strictly for you, wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, board, board questions for Chad or myself or our board? <laughs> no, I, just, I, I agree with uh, Chairman Ladson. I think uh, you know, y'all have your own priorities, probably eight. <laughs> <laughs> Softball field upgrades, I think, from my point of view, we should focus on getting that all on the same, on, on campus, instead of spending a bunch of money off campus. That's my, my personal opinion. But yeah, I like the uh, one that he showed the uh, soccer field up on Jones Street with the uh, track. track around it, and then the back to back fields down. Down on Fairview Road, one of seven. Yeah, that's what you I do think having it all in one site is a, from a safety transportation perspective, uh, it would be worth the money. Yeah. It's not having, having new drivers cross the construction zone to go to Webster and, and Who's riding with who and how are they getting there? You know, parents worrying about that just for a game and practice every afternoon. So I, I like just. I wonder if that's something that could be constructed in the off season. The football uh, field? Uh, um, it's, if you, yes, it could be. I mean, we just finished one for Morgan County and it was done and started. As soon as the season was over and it finished, like the grass was still green, <laughs> it really, really wet when they came in there. I assume it also be done in conjunction with the uh, upgrades of the concessions and stuff at the football field. Keep that will have to move a little bit, put the restrooms in them. Yeah, I assume you have a chair at the field. Yeah, the more you can do concurrently, the, the less expensive it will be. Uh, from you know, extending it out over years, you're paying for general conditions and mobilization uh, that you wouldn't have to pay if you do it all at one time. Right. Right. Get that concession and stuff down on the level of the fields, that brings in full time. That's right. So they have to be up there. And one of the things we have to consider is that off-season softball and baseball games are the Definitely going to take some 
Yeah, work is a, 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 a good term. Um, for the, the due diligence on the middle school, that includes architectural drawings. That, that's basically the evaluate the site in that site language. language. Yeah, that's the site. Pull the boards. Yeah, and that's that, that's on average. It just it really depends on what you find on that site. Uh, I mean, we've had other sites that look relatively flat, and it's taken over a year to get those uh, approved. Is it estimated cost of property in that? No, no, no. That's just no. that's just project cost, not land cost. Something that we may need to look at too is that you may know about this about that uh, blocking path that was presented to us a couple of weeks ago. Well, they saw this presentation next, so they know that there's some additional coordination that might okay, be so, yeah. We won't spend money on that. Right. <laughs> and they were provided with this information. They, they did have this information. Okay. Well, that's it's not a big project. Okay. Is this information on the website? It isn't now, but it can be. It's a public document that has right. part of this meeting, but we will certainly upload that. Um, I sent Don Lee a presentation just last week, so you can upload it to your information slide as well. Just in, 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 in thinking. seen as a challenge is that this this project we, we used to be able to build that in 12 months right. and now it's 18 it's 20 um, and especially with kind of these weird cycles that we have in this area of rain it can make it even longer than that so one question I do have it's a minor question on the fields that plan include netting around the fields we don't want a baseball to go through somebody's windshield they park along that road on Fairview Road, yeah, we have to because it, it definitely pulls the fields uh, closer to the edge right there. So, we'll seven with the baseball field, be the baseball field. that's right, yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 feedback from moving everything to on campus versus a facility off campus, a new facility up here, just how they, they view it um, moving forward. That would be nice if they, they had any suggestions. Yeah. We, we did have a number of stakeholder meetings with uh, faculty and staff and walked around and they gave us uh, feedback on that and we certainly can have another round of students and, and boosters whoever we need to in that area. So. What was the what was the I guess the, the stakeholder feedback on 
suggestions? What, what was their priority on A, B, or C for the facilities of the, the field? Accessibility was the first thing I was spoken about is accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there were a number of stories that were told about you know, grandparents that can't get to mm -hmm. the field, and, and that, that came up more than once. Uh, and then concessions and store toilets on the visitor side. Dr. Ash, has there been, you may have touched on this, has there been any type of survey or anything done in the middle school sent out to maybe the parents of each student? Uh, Not since I've been in this world, I did like there was one um, visit to Mr. Hill's office and they were able to get some I'd like to see if there's a survey maybe for new construction middle school to see what the outcome of that is. Would you prefer a new middle school preference? Mm -hmm. I think 
think I think we should went back into that instead of throwing another survey out there because I think people might be getting a little oversaturated with the surveys on this particular topic and it's it's not free to, to get that information either. That's another expense associated with it as well. So I know there was a part of that survey that did talk about one of the options being constructing your mill still off site somewhere. Maybe we should look back at that first. Before. I still have a copy of that. Mm -hmm. But it depends on the time. Like, not every time it's one strong response to the survey. Mm -hmm. And what year was that, 2016? We think it's 2016. I think it's maybe it was either 18. We moved to I think it was a little later than 16. Maybe 18. We'll pull back. So, uh, Mr. Jameson's correct. We, it was multi-tiered in that we preference about a middle school um, and also preference to converting one of the schools and we listed all the schools and would this be the school you'd want to convert um, there were questions about drilling down you know are you a parent of a child in this age group you know anticipating that your child come through it was a pretty detailed survey so we could absolutely get that to everybody Ms. Fox, um, on our budget retreat for commissioners, any way, and you probably already on top of this, to incorporate the numbers, the projections with our revenue streams coming in and you know, we'll see what we can, maybe we can all do. Can I agree with all the concerns uh, that Mr. Fred's brother? Of education, except one. I'm a graduate of Cross Creek School in Smoky Mountain High School. Two weeks I was scared to go into the, to the high school, but after that <laughs> it wore off pretty quick. And I think a lot of these people here today uh, you know, experienced the same thing. Uh, it wears off pretty quick, but uh, about the academics and everything, I, I agree with that 100%. Thank you. Any further discussion? Like a motion. Do I have a second? All those in favor? Our next regular scheduled Board of Education meeting will be February 27th, and it will be back in our board room at the Monster Coffee. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Little thanks.